Good morning, everyone. I'm just waiting for um, the attendee list to populate. People are still um, showing up on the list. So I'm just going to give that a minute or two. Morning, happy new year. Okay, it looks like our attendee list has uh, slowed down in populating. So I think we've probably got uh, most everyone here. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Happy new year. Um, today we are doing a presentation on our newest fund, which is the early stage commercialization fund. And so the, um, the leader of this session will be Laura Richard. Um, she is our director of research at the foundation. Um, we also have Holly Ailes and Ray Fitzpatrick on the call. If you would like to ask any questions, um, they're there for support because this is kind of a cross fund between research and VC. Um, so kind of bridges our two um, offerings together. So uh, with that, I just a couple of technical dif, uh, tech, technical details. Um, I will be managing the chat and the Q and A. Um, we will be having the session will be will be framed so that Laura will be presenting for 20 ish 25 minutes um, and then we will have an open Q and a session. Um, so we would ask that you would ask your questions either in the chat or the Q and a. Um, I will be monitoring both but preferably the Q and a. Um, if there are any questions regarding sound quality video presentation, um, please put those in the chat um, and we'll try to work out any technical issues there. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining us and I'll turn it over to Laura. Thanks, Hillary. Um, so we've prepared here a slide deck with some information about the fund. Um, so we're going to walk through these. Feel free to pose questions as we go along. We'll also be recording this and we'll post it up on our social media pages later if you want to go back over anything. And of course, this is new for all of us. So if you have any questions, concerns, thoughts, please feel free to reach out to us. If you don't have our email addresses, I've got them at the end uh, and we'd be happy to discuss this with you. So um, first of all, um, this fund is brand new for New Brunswick. Uh, we've never had anything like this in our province before. It is a non-repayable grant that is unleveraged the whole purpose of which is to support our academic community in pursuit of entrepreneurial opportunities. We haven't, however, invented something new. We've taken a tried and tested model from Nova Scotia, and with the help of the Novacor and ACOA, we're now piloting that here in New Brunswick. A couple of things I want to highlight, and we'll go over all this in more detail in terms of how this is different from a typical research grant that we might normally distribute. First of all, it's fast. All the money is meant to be used in one year. And the milestones are not traditional milestones related to advancement of knowledge, but rather commercially specific milestones that are about pursuing that entrepreneurial opportunity. Also, the final evaluation is a little bit different. From the applications that are submitted to us, we'll create a shortlist, and those shortlists of people will be invited to come pitch live to us in the same style as, for example, business plan competitions, and we'll select the final winners from that live pitch. Um, and then as Hillary mentioned, this is really a, a cross team effort. Um, and we're leading this both with our, our research team that many on the call are probably quite familiar with, but also with our venture capital team as there's a lot of elements here that are related to starting up a business. Uh, Ray, I don't know if you'd like to say a few words about why you think this fund is, is important for New Brunswick. Sure. Thanks, Laura. Um, I, I think the, the the main thing here is we've been able to create a program that I think addresses a big gap in the ecosystem. Um, I've worked with a few professors to you know help them with their technology and see if we couldn't actually start up a business, but we always seem to run into this phase where you know we just need a little bit more product development. We just needed to reach out to some customers. We just needed to get a business plan fully done. 
Um, and that was always out of the, the reach of, you know, NBIF and venture capital funding it. It just was never far enough along. So we were able to spend money on the research through Laura's group to get to a certain point, but it still didn't get to the point where I was able to fund it through the venture capital side. So we think this, um, this program and these grants are exactly what we need to actually be able to take that research that is on the cusp of commercialization uh, and really be able to bring it to that next level with some hands-on expertise to, to hopefully make it either venture capital ready, if that's the desire, so funded through our group, uh, or any other sort of commercialization, whether it's licensing or starting up a business that isn't venture backed, uh, all are perfectly good outcomes for us. Um, so yes, I see this as a, a great avenue to commercialize some research that may have been stuck uh, in kind of uh, no man's land for quite a while. Thanks, Ray. So um, I wanna take you through an example. Now, I wish we could talk about a real example of something that was funded through this early stage commercialization fund in Nova Scotia. However, confidentiality is really of the utmost importance for this fund. We're talking about cutting edge new research that's leading into commercial opportunities. Obviously with that kind of work, there's a lot of intellectual property concerns. So I'm sure you'll understand why we can't discuss a real case. However, we've cooked up a, a hypothetical, slightly facetious example just to walk you through what we mean with this fund. And, and I picked one that many of us will be familiar with. That would be the work of, of Marie Curie. So let's imagine Marie Curie is an academic at, say, the University of New Brunswick. Um, before applying for this fund, Marie is at the stage where she's been studying a new form of energy, uh, X-rays, and she postulates that they have some novel penetrating power. She's done some proof of concept tests with a lab device, and these tests suggest an interesting ability to visualize human bones, as evidenced by the scan of a hand showing a ring on it. Marie thinks, hey, you know, maybe there's something here of, of commercial importance that could be used more broadly outside of academia. So she submits an application to the Early Stage Commercialization Fund to turn this penetrating power into an instrument that doctors could use to image bones. Market potential seems high from her first estimates just based on the number of broken bones that are seen at a local hospital and there were costs to repair those with current medical tools. Based on that, we decide to award an ESDF to Marie and give her some money to start developing this instrument. So uh, what she manages to do in that first stage is develop a functioning first model um, and show that it can be used, in fact, in a medical setting to image bones and, and to help doctors repair those. Um, as she comes to the end of the grant, she starts talking to a partner who's interested in deploying that in a mobile setting. Um, for example, this little radiology van. And so she submits an application for stage two of the ESCF to do a field trial with this medical provider uh, with the idea that if that's successful, she might go on to license the technology. So I hope that gives you a bit of a, a general sense about the kind of work that we're hoping to support with this fund. So like I mentioned, this fund isn't new. It's something that's been run for a long time in Nova Scotia, and it's got a history of success that I just want to talk you through a little bit here. It's been going on since 2005 through InnovaCore. Um, and I think actually we have someone from InnovaCore on the line. Um, I don't know, Amanda, if you're able to um, say hi and maybe speak a little bit about your experience with the fund there. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, I'm uh, trying to maneuver this. Um, I don't think you can see me, but as long as you can hear me, yeah, I'm, I'm on the line. Happy to answer any questions about the experience in Nova Scotia. Great, thank you. Um, so in Nova Scotia, they've funded hundreds of projects through this over the last 16 years, and it's got a great track record of success. More than a third of the projects they funded turned into commercialized technology. And many of them are spin outs that are still active today. Um, the unleveraged part of this grant is the real game changer. And what they found is that giving the people money upfront in this space that's really at the cusp of research and VC is what enables them to be successful and then leverage significant funds later on. 
Uh, and so that's that's the story that that we've been developing with ACOA, with other stakeholders, about why it's really important to have unleveraged funds in this space. And we're, and we're confident that we're going to see some exciting new technologies commercialized as a result of this funding. Amanda, I don't know if there's any general examples that you're able to highlight from your experience with this. Oh, uh, there's so many. We actually just recently did um, some sort of number crunching and looking at a historical experience and realized that um, particularly in, in Nova Scotia, where we have a strong life science sector, um, I think we figured out that uh, approximately half of our investments actually originated in our early stage commercialization fund. Um, so they were able to sort of use that, that funding um, to launch them uh, forward into um, eventually building a startup that became invested. Wow, that's great. Thanks for sharing that. So um, I want to talk a little bit about why we at MBIF decided to do this and what our goals are with this fund. Our idea here is really that we're, we're narrowing the gap in between a research project and something that's VC ready. As Ray mentioned, that, that's a chasm that we and many other jurisdictions have. And it's not always easy to get from, okay, the academic research phase is complete to I'm ready for venture capital investment. In particular, we wanna use this fund to help inventors in New Brunswick to validate and assess new technology. So this isn't necessarily about developing new technology. We already have a lot of different funding sources that can help with that. But it's once you've done your initial development, you have a proof of concept, what funding do you now need in order to validate that and assess if it's ready for the market? Um, so advancing that market readiness is a key goal of this fund. Also, we, we want to create more spin out companies. Like Amanda said, for InnovaCore, a lot of their venture capital investments came out of this fund. And we see this as a great tool that can help feed our pipeline of VC opportunities. And it's a key goal of our government also to have more homegrown New Brunswick spin outs. So we do have a strong preference in this fund for projects that lead to the creation of companies. However, if the research you're developing doesn't lead to a company, but instead a licensing opportunity, that's also equally valid and something that we're happy to consider here. Now, as you know, we already have a fund that is aimed at research commercialization and that's our lab to market fund. So I just wanna highlight here some of the differences between them. It is a little complex. So if you're struggling to understand which fund is a better fit for your project, please don't hesitate to speak to us, but we'll be happy to give you a recommendation as to where you should apply. Firstly, they're, they're both eligible for projects that lead to spin out creations or licensing opportunities. However, the ESCF can't be used for a collaborative project with an existing industry member. This is really about creating new opportunities. So if you have a collaboration going on with someone in industry and you're looking for funding for that, lab to market is the answer for you. The ESCF also can't be used for contract research. Again, the lab to market or, or even our innovation voucher are probably better options. Now, one key difference is leverage. Our lab to market fund has a minimum two to one leverage. So MBIF can pay a third of the project costs. This early stage commercialization fund has no minimum leverage. Of course, if you have some leverage, please tell us about it because that will help us then to increase the fund size for other applicants. However, th there's no minimum here. There's also some differences in who can apply. So for the lab to market, it's a faculty member who leads the application. For the ESCF, as per the way InnovaCore runs it, we allow students and postdocs to apply as long as they have a faculty member as a co-applicant. And we just want that there for, for continuity and to be sure that the project has some guidance from somebody more senior. There's some differences in timelines. So the ESCF runs in definitive rounds. Round one just opened. The next round will be in the fall. We'll take you through the timeline a little later. Whereas our lab to market fund is always open. You can apply anytime. So if your project is particularly urgent and you'd have to wait a while for an ESCF round, it might be worth looking for the lab to market instead. Also the ESCF, like I said, is a one year project. Lab to market could be two years. So if your project is a bit longer, again, you may wanna consider a different option. And finally, in terms of grant size, the ESCF is a maximum of $50,000, whereas our lab to market has no limits. So if it's a project of much bigger scope, 
this early stage fund is probably not the answer for you. So again, if you have any questions about that or want to talk through a specific example, our, our staff would be happy to sit down with you. So um, let me take you through the opportunity in a little bit more detail. One given project could receive a maximum of two early stage commercialization fund grants over its lifetime because we have a phase one and a phase two. In the phase one, this is really about technologies that have that first proof of concept and are now in initial stages of development. You might have some, some rough initial ideas about market size, for example, or potential in the market, but you're still develop, developing those out. And you've identified some potentials for commercialization, but perhaps you haven't narrowed down on it yet. For example, maybe you haven't founded the company yet or identified who you'd be licensing this to exactly. In phase two, that commercialization opportunity has been solidified. You've founded the company, you're in talks with the partner who might be licensing this for example. You have much more clear ideas about what is the market size and what is the potential of this opportunity. Um, you've got your targets well identified, you know something about potential revenue streams, and now you're coming back to look for another $50,000 to really finish that bit of validation and get this to the stage where it could be ready for, for example, venture capital investment. Um, if you're not sure what phase you're in, don't worry about it much for the first application. We'll be able to change the phase on your application if needed. Um, the important thing to note though, is if you're coming back after a first grant for a second one, the evaluation committee will expect to see progress on the commercialization aspects. So if your initial market sizing ideas are still a little bit vague and hand wavy, if you're coming back for a second grant, they expect to see far more development around those ideas. So I just want to stress here that we're really looking for innovative technology with market potential that's ready to be accelerated in a one year time frame. If that time frame doesn't work for you, if it's much longer, if you're not sure if you're ready to be accelerated, you may be too early for this fund or it may not be the fund for you. Again, have a chat with us and we can probably help you find another funding opportunity. And I've just mapped out here at the bottom different typical stages of research and where our funding comes in. So if you're still looking at fundamental research, look to our traditional funding programs. We've got a whole suite of them. If this is about IP creation and protection, founding a company, developing a minimum viable product, that's ESCF. However, if, if you founded a company and it's already received some investment, you're past the stage of this fund. You're no longer early stage. That's when you should be talking to our venture capital team about further investment. If you've already formed up your management team, you're doing some in-market activities, again, you're not early stage anymore. We'd look to our traditional venture capital investments to help you out. Um, Hillary, do we have any questions yet before I carry on? No, I don't see any in the Q&A, but again, if you have any, feel free to pose them. Great, thank you. So I've spoken a lot about the money that this fund offers, and obviously that's very important, but we want to emphasize that it's more than just a check. Um, the ESCF successful applicants will have dedicated help in commercializing their projects. Um, so some of the things that we'd be ready to help you with would be, for example, connection to a relevant mentor. That could be someone at NDIF or it could be someone external. We've got a pretty broad network and we're happy to use that to connect you to the right person to help you move forward. It might also be some help from our staff in creating the framework for a business. Making things like pitch decks or business plans are, are non-intuitive and having the experience of someone who's done that before to guide you along and, and take you through the steps can be very valuable. We can also help you navigate, for example, different accelerator program options to see which one might be a good fit for you if that's something that you're gonna need in your learning journey. Perhaps you need some help forming up that management team. Maybe you're looking for a CEO or something similar and you'd like some suggestions. Again, we're happy to use our network to introduce you to some seasoned entrepreneurs to help you bring that management team together. Finally, when you're done your one year of funding, um, we'll be there to give you some guidance on what are the next steps. Maybe it's a consideration for venture capital investment from our own team. Maybe it's warm introductions to other investors or to some of these accelerator programs. 
again, it all depends on your project and where you're at. So that's why this is very much a one-on-one -on -one approach that, that we'll have dedicated staff working with. Um, so Holly, who's on the call, will be one of those people. Uh, and we'll be dividing that work in between our team, depending on your project and, and what kind of help you need. I just want to speak a little bit about eligibility. So all of the normal institutes we work with are eligible here. And I want to highlight, again, in the purposes of this fund, it's about helping people in the academic and research community to pursue entrepreneurial opportunities. If you're not based at a research institution, this isn't the fund for you. However, we can probably help fit you into an accelerator program or something similar that's not directed at the research market. Like I said, students and postdocs can apply, but we want to see a faculty member who's a co-applicant. And, and they do need to be current students when they apply for this, but they don't necessarily need to be students the entire length of the one year. So if you're coming to the end of your program, perhaps you're graduating in April, but you want to apply right now in January, that's OK. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I, I just want to highlight, too, is that if you've already founded the company that's going to be the, the commercial receptor for this opportunity, that's perfectly OK. But if that company is, is already receiving investment, then you're a bit too advanced for this fund. Laura, we do have a question um, which kind of um, ties in with eligibility. Um, and the question is, the ESCF is apparently exclusive for academia. For other early stage companies, what other funding programs besides lab to market are there available at NBIF? Thank you. I might uh, invite Holly or, or Ray to speak to that as they know that space better than I do. Yeah, for sure. So um, at NBIF, our main programs for early stage companies would be our startup investment fund and our venture capital fund. Uh, so that would be for early stage companies that say have a pitch deck, have financial projections, may or may not have customers, uh, but they definitely have a minimal viable product um, that they are able to offer. So it's kind of a higher bar than, the, than say the program we're talking about right now. Uh, they are equity based. So we do actually take an ownership position with that fund. So it's not grant based like we're talking about with this one. Uh, but I, I'd say the best thing we do, to do would be to touch base with either, well, most likely Holly would be the best one to touch base with. Uh, what they can do is review what you have to date. Uh, and even if we're not the funding partner or say it's, it doesn't quite make sense on that end, we know of all the other programs because uh, we use those from different agencies to help fund the startups that we invest in. So one way or another, I think we'll be able to provide some insight into where we think uh, the best places to get money would be and whether that includes MBIF or not. Great, thanks Ray. Okay, so moving on to eligible expenses, this fund will pay for most of the same things that our normal research grants pay for. Some of the eligible expenses include things like uh, labor, consulting fees, um, direct materials, that kind of thing. Um, IP development is another area that we'll consider here. So for example, patenting expenses. Um, the cost to assess your market potential is certainly an eligible expense here. So as we'll discuss when we get to the application, you do need to have some initial thoughts about what is the market size and potential for your technology. But if you want to go deeper on that and you're going to need help to do it, for example, to pay a consultant, that's certainly an eligible expense in phase one. Likewise, if you need some help to do strategic plans and that kind of thing, and you want to bring someone in to help you with that, that's an eligible expense here. Um, and in general, any kind of prototype development or technology validation related expenses. In general, though, company development expenses, like creating a website for the company, marketing materials, et cetera, are ineligible. However, there's a lot of other programs through people like ACOA that, that will often pay for that kind of thing. So if you want some suggestions on, on where you could look for those kind of expenses, we'll be happy to give you that advice. Um, Amanda, if you're still on the call, I, I don't know if you're able to speak to some of the typical things that you see this grant being used for. Um, sure, yeah. Um, so uh, I think we see it's usually a, a pretty mixed budget. Um, uh, often we'll see um, the uh, salaries for a student or for a postdoc or something being included, which we consider eligible. 
Um, I'm, I don't know if you're, you're doing the same, Laura. Um, yep. Yeah, um, uh, sometimes there's some um, consulting, like uh, you mentioned, the assessment of market, usually a small part going to IP, especially in the phase two, we see that a lot. Um, but yeah, a little bit of all of these things that go into building a project, um, but salaries are certainly one of the biggest, biggest pieces that we see, biggest percent of the budget. Great, thanks. The other thing I want to highlight here is that shortly after we make the decisions on who will be awarded funding, we expect the projects to start and then they must be completed within 12 months. So you do have to be at a stage where you're ready to, to action these budget items and start moving on it. If it takes you six months to, for example, recruit a postdoc and that's already half of your time gone. So, so that'll be a little bit difficult. So you may want to keep that in mind as you're drafting out a budget, what pieces can you press go on to quickly accelerate the development of this technology? So let me speak then a little bit more about timeline. So round one is now open, both for InnovaCore and uh, NBIF. So we're running these funding rounds in partnership. So starting and closing at the same time and also doing the assessment together. That's so we can all learn together and also leverage our expertise. For example, Amanda mentioned that InnovaCore works with a lot of life sciences companies. If you submit an application in the life sciences space, we'll probably ask their help to look at it and make an assessment. So like I said, round one now open. Any applications from New Brunswick go through NBIF. Applications from Nova Scotia will go, of course, through InnovaCore. We close on February 3rd, and then we're going to try to make a pretty quick turnaround on these and get decisions, final decisions sent by March 15th. Um, round one projects then must be completed by March 31st, 2022. So as you can see, you do have a, a pretty short window to confirm conditions once you get your grant and then get everything started so that you can have the money spent and the project done by March 31st of next year. Um, <clears throat> Round two will run in the fall. We, we haven't yet arrived at dates, but Amanda, I believe round two last year ran, opened sometime late September or so and closed in November. Yeah, that sounds right. Okay. And a third round provisionally at the beginning of 2022, again, January to February. So if you're not quite ready yet and you wanna plan for a subsequent round, keep those dates in mind. Again, all the successful applicants will receive mentorship and project guidance. The, the unsuccessful applicants will also receive feedback on why they were unsuccessful and would certainly be invited to apply in a later round if you want to take that feedback in and readjust your plan. We have $400,000 to disperse over three rounds. So that's something like eight to 10 projects that we expect to fund with the potential to grant more if there's some leverage sources available. So that's why we ask that if you do have leverage, let us know as that can help other applicants um, as we'd be able to potentially release more money that way. Finally, right now we're really focused on, on learning and starting this up, but in this summer and fall, our focus will shift to capacity building. So we expect to do a lot more work to, to help people in the ecosystem like yourselves to learn about research commercialization and prepare a potential application. So to that end, we're going to be doing things like running informational webinars, having some invited speakers, and working more one-on-one -on -one with potential applicants. Um, InnovaCore is already at this phase, so they're running a series of webinars, um, and I've got a slide about those at the end in case you're interested to join them. Um, I see we had some questions. Maybe I'll just pause there. Yes, we do have a question. Um, so what are the prime differences between phase one and phase two concerning eligible expenses? That's a great question. It is. Yeah, so all the same expenses are, are eligible in both phases. We don't separate that you can only apply for a certain expense in phase one versus phase two. So let me just return to this slide. So you could apply, for example, for expenses to patent in both phase one and in phase two. Um, but like Amanda said, we, we typically see more emphasis on consultants to do market assessments in phase one. 
because first you need to understand the size of your market and, and what your potential is here. And then perhaps more focus on things like uh, developing your IP or doing some advanced prototyping in phase two. Amanda, I don't know if there's any other differences you want to highlight there between expenses and the phases. Uh, no, that, that sounds great. That's exactly how we do it. Thanks. Okay. So um, moving on then to the application form. So this is now available on our application portal. It's also on the InnovaCore website and, and the two applications are the same. Simply ours is available in French and English. Um, I wanna highlight, this isn't a traditional grant application. So it's gonna look a little bit different and you'll be asked to describe some things that perhaps you haven't fully considered yet. Of course, the, the current stage of the technology, we need to understand what's already been done. Have you got your proof of concept and, and what remains to be done? Um, we would then wanna see an aggressive development plan for the one year of funding. Again, remember that if you're successful in this round one, for example, you have to have the project completed by March 31st of next year. So what are you gonna do in this year that really advances your commercialization plan? So again, the emphasis isn't on advancement of knowledge or, or innovation per se, it's, it's how are you going to finish validating this piece of technology? How are you gonna get that much closer to launching a company or securing a licensing opportunity? Tell us a little bit about what you think your exit strategy will be. It's okay if you're still not entirely clear, but you know, is this a spin out? Is it a licensing opportunity? And have you thought a little bit about that? Like who might you license this to? Could be a list of companies, some, some different sectors you're considering. Um, who might be leading that spin out? Would it be you personally? Might it be somebody else in your team? Um, give us some ideas. In, in phase one, this can still be a little vague, but by phase two, you've got to have this clarified and have identified, you know, which of these it is, founded the company and or like be looking at a, a select list of people for licensing. Um, we also ask you for a market analysis, um, including an assessment of your competitive advantage. Amanda, I don't know if you could speak a little bit to what this typically looks like in, in phase one versus phase two. Um, so, so in terms of um, the competitive advantage, you mean? Yeah, the, the market analysis section in general, how people- Yeah, um, yeah and I, I know it's, um, I think that that's probably the area that I have uh, researchers uh, come to us the most, uh, either pre application or sometimes post application because it's um, not usually something that you see in a in a research type of research grant uh, application. Um, however, it's uh, extremely important to us to assess the commercial potential. Um, we have some resources that we we uh, will point you to if you follow up in a, in a, or if you follow up after this with um, Hillary or Laura or um, in Nova Scotia with us um, that will help you develop out the market analysis because I think it's an area that's uh, not as comfortable as the research section and as well as doing a competitive advantage which is sort of an overview of all of the competing technologies in your space. Thanks for that. Um, and with this application, if, if you're not sure how to compete it, please don't let that be the barrier that prevents you from applying. We're available to help as well as your institution's tech transfer office. So one point I, I didn't speak to yet is that if you wanna work with your tech transfer office and, and it's your choice whether you wanna include them in your application or not, they can be a valuable resource. They're, they're often familiar with these kind of assessments and they may be able to provide you some, some extra help to complete this. So again, we'd be happy to see an application that, that you've done in partnership with the people in your industry engagement section, or you can submit an application solo too. And I'll, I'll just add there too, uh, Laura, that we sent, um, like for those of you who are familiar with our research portal, um, as you know, you go in and you complete the application, but we have sent a word copy around to all the institutions as a template um, of the portal version. So if you feel more comfortable kind of drafting that in a word format, um, we can send you that template so that you can, we can easily exchange that back and forth via email. 
as opposed to um, we also have the ability to go in the portal and look at any applications as well um, from an admin perspective so just as an fyi those tools are out there um, and we hope you use them thanks hillary um so let me move on then to the evaluation process as I mentioned earlier, the evaluation process is shared between MBIF and InnovaCore. However, I do want to emphasize again that confidentiality is very important. So everyone who's looking at the applications will be signing an NDA and we'll keep those in, in strictest confidence. So you can feel confident putting down the, the commercial details that are necessary for the application as we'll be treating those um, very carefully. From the paper applications, we'll select a short list of applicants. And then we're going to invite only that short list to pitch live to the evaluation committee. Tentatively, we've scheduled this for March 3rd or 4th. We are aware that is March break. Um, however, it was difficult to find a time slot that, that worked in both New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and was before the fiscal year end. So, so if you're applying and you think those dates are gonna be a problem for you, let us know and we'll attempt to accommodate if we can. We will provide all the applicants written feedback from their application from the evaluation committee to also give you some guidance on what the evaluators found good, what they found with weaker points and, and how you might improve for next time. Um, so we've got three main points for looking at in terms of evaluation. The first one is really on the uniqueness of the technology and how important is it? So what are the features and benefits? What stage is it at? We want to make sure it's not too early stage and that you do indeed have proof of concept already. And, and do you have a good proprietary position on this? Is there already something similar in the market? We also want to know about the commercial significance, obviously. So, you know, that's why the market assessment is so important here and the competitive analysis. They really speak directly to this evaluation point. And finally, you know, is there a potential for a commercial return? We are looking for potentially venture grade investments here. Um, so we're looking for something that could generate a significant return for an investor and, and not just be a, a small hobby business. And also what's the commercial readiness of this technology? Um, so do you, do you have the right team who can help you develop it? Do, do you understand the potential obstacles? Um, is your IP regulatory, you know, et cetera, is that, is that strategy well developed and, and sound? Um, and like I said, do you have the potential for, for a spin out company here? So those are the main things the committee is going to be looking at. We've spoken a lot about spin out companies. Uh, I believe I mentioned earlier that that is our preferred route, but if you have a licensing opportunity, we're happy to consider that also. Okay, um, so I just want to highlight that InnovaCore is offering a couple of webinars, um, and these can probably help you build out your application. For example, the market sizing one, we'll talk in a lot more detail about how you do that market assessment for your application. Um, there's also a great webinar about intellectual property due diligence at, at this kind of early stage. Um, and there's also one about value proposition. Amanda, I don't know if you want to say anything else about these webinars. Um, no, I hopefully that's um, it will be something to get you started. But just to say that we're we're always open to topics or suggestions from from applicants um, of things that we need to cover. Um, these are kind of just cover the real basics of the application and the core sections that you need to complete. But um, we're happy to provide more resources wherever is needed. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, like I said, we're going to try to do more capacity building this summer. So if you have some ideas or suggestions on content that you'd like to have covered, maybe, you know, people or types of people you'd like to hear speak and get experience from, please let us know. Um, we're still at a formulation stage of figuring out what the, that capacity building will look like. And, and we're happy to try to include your, your comments and thoughts. Okay, I think that's everything. So I'd like to open the floor now if there's any more questions for me or Ray or also for Amanda from InnovaCore on here. We currently don't have any open questions um, in our Q&A, but again, as Laura mentioned, feel free to pose them there. We'll wait a minute or two just so everybody has an opportunity to type them out if they have them. 
Those include comments. Um, did you go over the size of the first funding pool instance? Good question. Indeed. So the total funding pool is 400,000. We haven't said that we're going to divide that evenly between the three, lamp, three rounds. We want to wait and see what demand is. Uh, for example, maybe in this first round, not as many people will apply. Um, and so perhaps we, we won't disperse a full third. Maybe in the second round, we'll have a lot of quality applications and we want to disperse more. So we're keeping it fluid. And like I said, with the potential to perhaps add more money later on if there's some leverage that's available. Uh, we have a comment as well from Eric. I think this program is filling an important gap here. Thanks for innovating on innovation funding. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Well, if, if no other questions, oh, I see one more just popped in. Um, talking about how this might fit for college level R&D. Yeah, that's a really good question. Maybe before I tackle it, Amanda, do you want to speak a little bit about how InnovaCore has tried to fit colleges into this model? Sure. Um, so we, we definitely, colleges are um, eligible for this. Um, but I would say that, and we always reach out and we like to see applications from the colleges. However, I think one of the challenges, the reasons that we don't see as many awards go to the colleges in our experience has been that at least in Nova Scotia, the colleges are very much industry led. So that goes back to the sort of eligibility for ESCF where we're looking for sort of a, a research institution uh, born innovation. So it's being uh, built in the institution and led out of there rather than industry engaging the institution to do some work for them or to even uh, partner with them on it. Um, so I think that can be sometimes a challenge, uh, at least in, in Nova Scotia and how our colleges operate and why we might not see as many awards come out of there. Um, not that they're not doing great stuff, but it just doesn't always fit with the eligibility, but definitely eligible. Thanks. Um, I'd highlight that we're working directly with the um, industry liaison contact at, at each college in the province. So. Uh, principally Scott Henwood at NBCC and Alain Doucet at CCMB um, to identify if they have potential opportunities, work through what those might look like, and then see how they could fit here. So agreed uh, in terms of framed on um, paper, colleges may not seem to fit quite as squarely, but, but we're happy to make sure that they also have equal access to this funding and, and don't hesitate to reach out if you have a question or a thought that you think might help include them here. Okay, a couple more questions as well. Um, thanks for those. Um, do you have planned access or give consideration to cost benefit beyond the monetary context, like from a sustainability perspective? Hmm. Interesting question. I, I'm not really sure how to answer that off the cuff. I don't know if any of the other panelists have thoughts on that one. Um, maybe. Um... I could touch on it a bit just from the perspective of one of our um, what we call our target industries is clean technology so and there's a few areas in there that would fall under sustainability ag tech clean tech um, some of the ocean tech um, so they're definitely target industries and would have that sustainability component um, that we would prioritize but um, depends on sort of what you're, if you're thinking more about, do we assess in terms of social impact? It would be more from a industry, um, target industry or target sector perspective rather than a social impact, I guess. Um, though we certainly look at that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Amanda. Um, like we showed in the initial evaluation criteria, the focus is really on commercial significance, um, less on socioeconomic impact. That being said, we do have other funds that are about um, social impact. So, you know, if you have a specific thing in mind you want to discuss with us, again, we'd be happy to try to path find with you on that one. Great. Thank you. And uh, one more question. Is a faster exit strategy slash IP buyout better than a larger payoff later? 
faster yet smaller? Uh, quite a philosophical question. Ray, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that one. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> both work. Any exit happening at all is always welcomed. Um, I mean, for instance, recently we've had two exits. Uh, one returned us $300,000, the other returned us $500,000. But to your point, I mean, the three, the smaller exit was a 95% return on investment, um, where the one where we made more money was only 15%. So yes, time is money. Um, I, I don't think we really dive at, at this stage is so hard to predict an exit. Um, so trying to say whether it's two years out, five years out, 10 years out will be ex extremely difficult. So uh, I, I wouldn't put too much weight into that piece of it. Uh, we're looking to fund really great research to become really great companies. Uh, and the exit piece, while important and, and how it comes, is so unpredictable this early on uh, that I wouldn't worry too much about that. Great. Thanks, Bray. So I don't see any other questions um, or comments in the chat or the Q&A. So I think... Um, a comment, just thank you very much for providing this information and you're welcome. Well, I, I think that closes us up then. Thanks everybody. Um, I've left our email address up here on the screen. So please do reach out um, if you wanna discuss a specific case or go over anything we, we spoke about here. We'd be happy to chat with you. Sure. And uh, just as our, the, uh, the links to those um, webinars that Laura mentioned that InnovaCore is hosting in the recent days or weeks, um, those are available on the InnovaCore website under the events section. Um, but if you need, um, if you can't find them and need any information, please feel free to reach out and we'll send those along as well. Or a copy of this presentation if you would like it. Yeah, I think we can do a copy of the presentation to all the attendees after this. Sure. Okay. Oh. Can you share all the slides? There you go, Eric. Yes, we will. <laughs> okay, awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.